Hello everybody. We have reached the chapter on schizophrenia and this is a big chapter. Schizophrenia is arguably the ultimate in psychological breakdown in terms of disorders. It is, it can be the most serious and the most baffling disorder that we have. And really it's not just one disorder. There are just so many variations among people who have schizophrenia that I literally could bring in 20 different people who've been diagnosed with schizophrenia and they would all behave differently. Some of the folks would clearly be very ill and you would know that they they really were, were suffering and very sick. And other people, and we're going to see a video example of one or two, you would, you would just never guess. It would be really difficult to tell. Now this uh, first slide I have here, this is kind of interesting. Lewis Wayne was a uh, painter and uh, lived from 1860 to 1939, like as you can see. And this was, you know, back before they had good diagnoses, Emil Kropelin, as we'll talk about, just they were still trying to figure out what schizophrenia was. And it's speculated that he did develop schizophrenia. So one of the ways they think this is by looking at his paintings. And apparently one of the things he liked to paint was cats. So in the upper left-hand corner, you can see a picture of a fairly normal looking cat. And then as you go clockwise, they become more and more abstract and bizarre and that when those were painted in his later years so the speculation was really as he descended into more psychotic behaviors his his portraits kind of reflected that so really interesting this is a long chapter there's a lot of information I want to share um, we know a lot about schizophrenia. There's a lot that we don't know, but I'm really eager to share the things that we know and, and try and help you gain a greater understanding because this is really the disorder that tends to be the most understood, probably apart from dissociative identity disorder, uh, and the one that is oftentimes blamed for things like violent acts. So it's really important to me that you have a solid understanding of this. I'm going to break this chapter into two different lectures. So this one I'm going to cover just introductory kinds of material and then the symptoms. And then the second video lecture I will cover the cause and the treatment of this disorder. So we'll break it um, into two parts. I have a ton of video clips in here to show you, most of them very brief. There's two ways you can access this since you can't really click them right in this video. I will put the links in the description of this video here on YouTube. And then if you go on Blackboard to the unrecorded PowerPoint section, this PowerPoint will be posted not recorded, but you can just click on the links directly from there. But it's it's very important that you look at those video clips because they're great demonstrations of the disorder. This really is one that you have to see to understand. So let's get started, do some introductory kinds of things here. I mentioned a minute ago that it's not just one disorder, it's really kind of a group of disorders which all have different symptoms. And it very much is a brain disease. Schizophrenia is a disease of the brain. But even knowing that, it's not treated the same as, say, diabetes or cancer or another type of disease. There's still a lot more stigma attached to it. But it is a whole body disorder. It affects almost everything about a person. It involves dysfunctions of behavior, of thought, primarily thought, feeling, perceiving, relating, um, and we know so much about it, but there's still a lot we don't know as well. This first video clip I'm going to ask you to look at is of a patient named Jerry. It is an old clip from the early 80s, but uh, I've used it for years. I've I have searched and searched for other clips that might be a little bit better or different, but I still keep coming back to this one. So I'd like you to take a look at that. The scene opens with uh, he's living in a psychiatric facility and they are interviewing him to try and understand his symptoms a little better. And then there's some interviews with his mom and his family, and it's absolutely fascinating. His name is Jerry. So I will refer to him a few times as we talk about these uh, symptoms because it's just a, a really good example of it. 
Now, as far as how long schizophrenia has been around, I mentioned uh, Emil Kropelin a few minutes ago. But Emil Kropelin, who we talked about in the diagnosis chapter, first identified the symptoms of schizophrenia in the late 1800s. And he discovered that this is something that affects people early in life, in their late teens and early 20s. And then he put it together with other symptoms to try and understand it. But he called it dementia praecox. Schizophrenia is not dementia. It's not a disintegration of the brain or a deterioration of the brain, but it absolutely affects the brain. So he was very much correct about that. Um, and what they called this was mental deterioration. That was really just the language of the time, although we do not see deterioration of the brain. Schizophrenia was coined in the early 1900s, not too much longer, by Eugen Bleller, who was a psychiatrist, and he termed, actually coined the term schizophrenia, and he called, he meant schizophrenia to mean split mind. I think this is part of how we get our misunderstanding of multiple personality and schizophrenia. People with schizophrenia do not have multiple personalities. They don't have more than one personality. They don't have split personality. Uh, the split mind can refer to a split between reality and what the person believes. It can be a split between perception and sensation. It can be a split between feelings and cognitions. All that is correct, but it doesn't mean different personalities. So that's something to think about. Um, one, another way to think about it with this split is that the forces that connect one function in the body to the next are destroyed. For example, the connection between emotion and, and cognition. That's one way to think about it. Now, in terms of prevalence, how common is, is this disorder? The lifetime prevalence in the U.S. is estimated to be about 1 to 2 percent. So obviously not really common, but we, I wouldn't necessarily call this a really rare disease as well. And we have some other statistics to show this. In the United States, about 40% of admissions to psychiatric hospitals are for schizophrenia. So that just, that just gives you some context between two to four million um, per year. We also know that about half of all hospital beds and psychiatric facilities are for patients with schizophrenia. Now most of these are short-term facilities. We know that there is an estimate of between 10 and 13 percent of the homeless population has schizophrenia, but that's just an estimate because of course these are folks that are probably not getting medication regularly, they're not getting help regularly, but these are just rough estimates because this in many ways is the most debilitating psychological disorder. It lends itself very much to homelessness. Just something to think about. Uh, as Krapelin discovered, this is a disorder that affects mostly young people, more young people. The range of the development of schizophrenia is 15 to 45. 15 is on the young end, 45 is really old for the development of schizophrenia. The median age is around 25. So this is something that strikes young people just really at the beginning of adulthood. Males and females are affected about the same, but there's a difference in terms of age. Males are more likely to have symptoms appear at a younger age, 20 to 25-ish, and females at an older age, uh, late 20s or so. Not too many people are diagnosed in their 30s or 40s, however. Uh, and this chart shows this. So age at onset in years, so we've got clearly spikes up here. Uh, in the 20s, early 20s, late 20s. So we've got um, number of onsets. So that's, I don't know if that's per 100,000, I would imagine. But the point is that you see this graph start to go down. So from here, we look um, much less common in the 30s. And then when you get down into old, it just doesn't happen. I mean, we just rarely diagnose this when people are older. We know that there are some racial disparities with this in terms of diagnosis, maybe not in terms of a current, but definitely diagnosis. And these statistics are from a few years ago. We know that black or African-American individuals are twice as likely as white, Hispanic, or Asian individuals to be diagnosed. And we also know that this is very likely to be an overdiagnosis because in minority patients, mood disorders are more likely to be misdiagnosed as psychosis. 
psychosis. So a person has symptoms and maybe they're depressed and sometimes, as we talked about, delusions can go along with mood disorders and they are minority patients are more likely to be diagnosed with schizophrenia or a psychotic disorder. There are also some links to income. We know that minority patients are more likely to be lower income and schizophrenia disproportionately affects lower income individuals. So we will get into all that. Okay, let's go ahead and talk about the symptoms of this disorder. There are a lot of them. I'm not even going to talk about all of them, but I am going to talk about quite a few of them. The thing that I want you to keep in mind, though, is that no one symptom has to be present to diagnose schizophrenia. Once I get through the symptoms, I'm going to tell you briefly what the DSM criteria are and what that requires, but no one of these symptoms has to be present, and that's important. Okay, so what I've done is to take all the symptoms and put them into categories. That's really the easiest way to do this. So we'll start off with the category of thought and language symptoms. I mentioned that schizophrenia is primarily a thought disorder. So disorganized thinking is the hallmark of schizophrenia. Well, the only way we know what a person's thinking is by how they talk. So most of the time you see the thought symptoms come out in how people talk. So let's look at some examples of how we see this. First of all, through their use of incoherent language. Now, you've probably heard the word incoherent before. Incoherent means you can't understand the person. They're very hard to understand. Now, oftentimes we can't understand the person, but they can understand. So these next couple symptoms I want to give you are examples of how we would see incoherent language. Uh, first of all, loose association. Sometimes we call this derailment. This is when a person can't stick to one topic. They can't answer questions that are fairly straightforward. And the Jerry, the video that I had posted earlier, he's a very good example of that. They ask him questions about how are you doing? And he talks about getting off cigarettes and then getting a job in a bakery. And then he talks egg and sperm and nuclear fusion, kind of all over the place. So that's very common with schizophrenia. And the way we think about it is that people with schizophrenia are kind of at the mercy of their associative processes. They can't really dismiss their first association to anything. So let me give you an example. If I said, um, what, what do you want for your birthday? And you think, oh, I'd like a vacation. Oh, I, I want to go skiing and it would be really fun to ski in Switzerland. Do you know, you know, Switzerland, that's where they have a lot of money. And I wonder if all the celebrities go there. And I really like Mariah Carey in particular. So I'm going off in a whole different direction than the question you asked me. But it's because for all of us, we make associations to everything we think about or uh, were asked, but we tend to, we keep those down. We can keep those in line to keep our thoughts straightforward and answer the question and stick to the subject. And many people with schizophrenia just don't have the ability to do that. So thoughts are loosely connected. We also see an example of something called alosia. Alosia is when a person is speaking, but they're not really saying much. And again, Jerry in that video talking about the, um, you know, get a job in a bakery and get off cigarettes and it doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. He's not really telling us anything meaningful. That's a way to think about elosia. We also sometimes will call that poverty of content. Now, again, in one person, we're probably not going to see all of these symptoms. Another example of, so I'm still talking about incoherent language here, another example of that would be neologisms. Neologisms are made up vocabulary words. So, and, and sometimes a person does these by combining other words. So they might say the word abology to mean abnormal psychology, or they might say the word slark, which means something, you know, means something to the person. So oftentimes a person with schizophrenia knows what these things mean, but no one else really does. This video clip, which I will link and I would really like you to take a look at, it's also older, but it's from the same video that the first clip came from, from Jerry. It's a young woman named Heather and her story is just so compelling. It's about an eight or nine minute clip, but 
I encourage you to watch it all. Uh, she is, she just like Jerry, are very ill, and they tell a little bit of Heather's backstory. But in the interview with the cameraman, when she's sitting there drinking her Pepsi and spilling it, she's using words that don't really make any sense. Um, part of it is because she is missing several teeth, and I think it's hard for her to pronounce things. But out in the driveway with her mother, she mentions a word, and her mom has to figure out what it is. So sometimes we'll see these made-up vocabulary words. We also, another symptom of incoherence would be clang associations. Now, you know how when we put words together to make a sentence, we put them together based on meaning. So you can understand what I'm saying to you because the words mean something to you. But people with schizophrenia will sometimes put words together based on how they sound. Um, and here's just an example. You don't have to write this down, but you'll get the idea. Sometimes it's based on rhyming. So this was a quote from a patient. The train rain brained me. He ate the skate, inflated yesterday's gate toward the cheese grater. So everything is really put together by rhyming and sound. So sometimes we see that. Another example would be word salad. I don't know if you all remember these. You might have been too young when these came out, but these refrigerator magnets, and they had a bunch of different words on them, and people would put them on their refrigerator and just for fun walk by and then make a sentence out of it, just kind of a fun thing. Um, imagine if you just threw all those on a table and then just plucked out words randomly and put them in a sentence and read the sentence. It would make no sense. So that's exactly what word salad is. It's really meaningless speech, confused, meaningless speech by a person. And really, this one, the train brained me, that's another example. In addition of clang associations, that's also word salad. Let me read you another example from a patient of word salad. I went home yesterday and the day before and the day before and I yelled four on the golf course. The salad was excellent and had nuts and grapes. The underwear man on TV is a grape and they made me sick as a kid. So words just put together, no real meaning behind it. Okay, and the final example of incoherent speech here would be echolalia. And the way I think about this is if any of you have a younger brother or a sister or maybe a cousin, and when they were little, one of the things that they liked to do to annoy you, or maybe you did this to an older sibling, would just to be to repeat everything they said. Shut up. No, you shut up. I'm going to tell mom. I'm going to tell mom. You broke it. You broke it. Well, people with schizophrenia sometimes do that, not to annoy you, but they are unable to produce any original speech themselves. So they might either echo what you say, or they might echo something else they've heard. So sometimes people will just speak in television commercials. They'll just say the things they heard on a TV commercial or a TV show, or maybe read in a book. So the bottom line is really an, an inability or an interference in their ability to produce any kind of meaningful speech. So they repeat vocalizations of another. That's basically what's going on there. Okay, so all of those are examples of incoherent language, and that gives us a clue as to how distorted the person's thinking is, okay? So this, what we're doing here is we're looking at thought and language symptoms, and incoherent language was the first one. The second example of thought and language symptoms are delusions, which are very common in schizophrenia. People get delusions and hallucinations mixed up all the time, so let me clarify. Delusions are beliefs you have that are false. They are false, and you believe them despite evidence to the contrary. So these are very common, very, very common in people who have schizophrenia. Delusions are not something you can talk a patient out of. They truly believe these things are true despite what someone has told them. So if someone has a delusion that squirrels are being sent to take over the entire earth, you know, we know that's not true, but a person with schizophrenia may have that idea in their head. Let me give you some examples of different types of delusions people with schizophrenia can have. One of the most common, if not the most common, are delusions of persecution. So this is when people are afraid that they're being plotted against or spied on or someone is following them, and it could be by anyone or organization. Um, sometimes they think that they're being plotted against by the, the church or a family member. Um, 
it really could be anything. One of the most interesting clients I have ever had was a number of years ago, a, a middle-aged man who had schizophrenia. And he was pretty high-functioning for the most part. He lived uh, by himself in an apartment, and a social worker would come and help him out and things. But he just had a terrible delusion that people of a certain race that was different than his race were out to get him. And so every time he passed a person on walking on the street of this particular race, he would uh, either apologize to the person for something he, you know, never did, or cross the street or be very afraid that that person was out to get him. And he actually believed that people of this race were trying to poison him. One of the most fascinating things about this man is that uh, he had food in his home, you know, canned food, and he would go to the store. But when he would go to eat it, he he couldn't do it because he was afraid it had been poisoned. So every day he had to go to the grocery and get, you know, fresh meat or fruits or whatever. He had to actually pluck it from the grocery store, go home and eat it right away because he believed that anything that had been in his apartment for any length of time had been poisoned. So, you know, it was very difficult for him to cope and, and to get around. And this isn't something you can talk someone out of. So he was um, a, a pretty ill individual. This video clip that I'm going to have you watch is Jerry again on a home visit. So he basically, and this was back in the 80s, really before deinstitutionalization, he lived in a psychiatric hospital kind of facility and had been given a weekend pass to go home, and he lived in Louisville, I think. So this scene is of a conversation that he was having with his dad, and clearly he had delusions of persecution. He was afraid his dad was going to try and hurt him or kill him, so please make sure you take a listen to that. Okay, so delusions of persecution aren't the only types of delusions. Some patients have what we call delusions of control, and this is where people feel like they're controlled by some sort of outside force, like a, a particular person or the government is a very common one. People may believe that thoughts are being placed in their head, or sometimes they may believe that their thoughts are being stolen from their head. Uh, I had a, a client once who believed that he was being hypnotized by his church. So he really thought that every thought in his head was being planted in his head by the church. So that's a delusion of control. And it's also very common. Um, many of these folks have a lot of guilt and shame. So there are delusions like that as well, which I'll get to. But lots of times they'll have a lot of obscene thoughts. And they believe those are planted in their head by some sort of external, external force. Okay, we have delusions of reference. This is a really interesting one. Um, these are where people believe that an external event refers specifically to them. So you see this picture here, this Nike slogan, this old Nike slogan, yesterday you said tomorrow. So sometimes people with schizophrenia will think that they're, that's me, they're pointing at me. They are referring directly to me. So billboard messages, like the old Nike slogan, just do it. They might think that refers to them. If they hear something on the TV news, they may feel that refers to them. So people can sometimes get very scared and a little bit paranoid as well because feeling like all these things are um, intended for them. One of the most interesting demonstrations of delusion of reference I've ever seen was not a client of my own. It was a video interview that I saw in training. And it was a woman who was um, a substitute school teacher, so she didn't have to work full time. And she came in talking about this relationship she had with a local radio disc jockey. And she talked about how special this relationship was. And then when the interviewer started asking more questions, it turned out they'd never met because it was a secret relationship. She said it got started one night because she was listening to the radio and he was doing his nightly show. And he said, over the radio, this one's for you. And she said, and then he played a song and she said, that was the start of it. She said that was the signal, and then every night after that, he would say that about the same time, this one's for you. And so she developed these feelings for him, and she swore up and down it was mutual. She said that she started writing letters to him, and she would send them to the station. She didn't understand why he, well, she did, but um, the interviewer said, well, did he ever contact you or write back? And she said, oh, no, no, he couldn't do that because he was married, and we had to keep this a secret. And apparently she would show up at local uh, kind of malls and things where he would appear. 
and one time she didn't identify herself to him but he handed her a picture and said this is for you and so she took that as a cue so she just essentially went on and on about the secret relationship and you know it was never reciprocated so a, a sad example but just absolutely fascinating one delusion of reference okay now i'm not going to go through all the different delusions but i do want to talk about two more delusions of sin and guilt i already mentioned uh the man i the client i mentioned who fears that people are poisoning him he also had a delusion of sin and guilt there were there were um there were ideas in his head that he had assaulted a number of different women and when he first told me that i was like okay i wonder if this is true so i did some research and such and there was that never happened. There was never any evidence that that happened. No one had ever made claims. Um, and you might think, well, maybe he did that and now he's feeling guilty about it. And maybe, but there was absolutely no evidence. Um, so that appeared to be just a product of his schizophrenia. So sometimes people will think that they've harmed others. And then the last delusion we'll talk about is the one that most people have heard of, and that is delusions of grandeur. This is when people with this disease think that they are someone in particular famous or someone with a special skill or someone important. So they might think that they are world-renowned doctors or actors. Um, oftentimes great historical figures are common. So people have claimed that they are Jesus Christ or Napoleon or Joan of Arc, but as I talked about in the depression chapter, these can be dangerous because take for instance, this guy, and this was like a, you know, I'm not saying he had schizophrenia. This was just a random picture on the internet, but say he really thought he was Superman and tried to jump off of a building. So there have been numerous cases of people who've harmed themselves through that. Uh, the White House gets calls for forever. It gets calls all the time from people saying they know how to solve world, world peace and they've invented a new nuclear weapon they should use. So all that thing kind of all that kind of thing happens very commonly. I want to read you really quickly an, one of the most interesting examples of a delusion that I have uh, ever read. So it's a, a couple of paragraphs. So just kind of sit back a minute and listen here. So this is a case of a 22-year-old male student who performed surgery for eight hours in his college dorm room, deep in his own abdomen, with a precision that astonished surgeons. He had spent months preparing for the surgery, which he said was intended to denervate his adrenal glands. He read surgical textbooks and acquired instruments. At the time of the operation, he sterilized his dorm room, anesthetized himself with barbiturates, put on a sterile mask and gloves, and draped his body in sheets. Lying down and looking at strategically placed mirrors to obtain the optimum view, he began by cleansing his abdomen with alcohol. The incision was made with the scalpel, exposure obtained by retractors, and the dissection carried out with surgical instruments. After eight hours, so he's operating on himself in his dorm room, true story, he had a minimal blood loss but was unable to obtain adequate exposure to enter the retroperitoneal space because of the unexpected pain he had in pulling back his liver. Exhausted, he bandaged his wound, cleaned up his room, and called the police for transport to the hospital because of a rupture. So the guy had a delusion that he could perform surgery and he tried to do that. I read about this case a long, long time ago and just was really amazed by it. But then when I honestly, when I was in graduate school finishing up and working in a psychiatric hospital, we had a case and this was back in the oh, when was this, or mid 90s, early 90s, made national news of a guy who was an occupational therapist at a local hospital. This was in Florida. And he... Um, Come to, come to find out after interviews with him, he was having trouble in his sexual relationships with women. And so he made the decision on his own that if he no longer had testosterone, he would no longer have a sex drive and then wouldn't have these problems anymore. So he decided to castrate himself. 
So this man who worked at a hospital, he managed to scurry off with instruments and obtain, you know, um, drug painkillers and all that sort of thing. And one day in his house, he attempted to remove his own testicles and he successfully, I know everybody's crossing their right now, right? Even if you're a female, you're doing that. Ugh. So he managed to successfully remove one of his testicles, but couldn't get the bleeding stopped. So he had to call the squad. So the squad took him to the hospital. They bandaged him him up and then they brought him over to where I was working to the psychiatric hospital after he had healed some so it just and and I uh I didn't get to work with him much just in a couple of therapy groups and it was just absolutely fascinating um and I don't know that he was diagnosed with schizophrenia but he definitely had that delusion of grandeur so just incredible Okay, so let's answer the question, why do people have these delusions? Why do people with schizophrenia have these delusions? We know that it actually might be a coping mechanism for some people because a person with schizophrenia has so much internally going on. They have so many things, uh, uh, thoughts that are frightening, emotions that are frightening, that they don't understand. And this may just be a way to adapt to the changes taking place within themselves. That's kind of the current line of thinking. Okay, so all of that are examples of thought and language symptoms. That's all one category of symptoms for schizophrenia. The next category of symptoms are perceptual symptoms. So a person who has schizophrenia has a view of things that's different. You look at this picture here and probably all of us see a face, right? Okay, but for most, I would assume most of us, all of us, the, fa the eyes aren't moving, the mouth isn't moving, but you can clearly see a face. It's like an optical illusion. Or think about a time where you swear somebody called your name. You swear you heard your name and you're looking around, there's nobody you know. Um, or you think see something move and it actually doesn't. Well, a person with schizophrenia has that happening regularly and it's extremely disturbing. So what we seem to think is that people with schizophrenia who have perceptual symptoms, they are unable to sort out and process all the sensory information that we are exposed to all the time. So as you're sitting here listening to this lecture, if you turn it off for a minute and attempt to think about some of the things I've said, there's a lot going on around you. Maybe you hear somebody mowing the grass outside, maybe your brother's yelling from another room, maybe the air conditioner's making a sound, uh, maybe you hear some other sound somewhere. You are being bombarded, you know, maybe your nose feels tickly. We're being bombarded by sensations all the time. Healthy people are able to screen all those out and focus on what they need to focus. But we seem to think for people with schizophrenia, they really are not able to sort all that out. So they see things that are different, hear things that are different. They may, odors may be, you know, stronger, sounds may be louder. All those are perceptual symptoms. And the main perceptual symptom that people with schizophrenia experience are hallucinations. Hallucinations are not thoughts. These are perceptual experiences. When people have a perceptual experience in the absence of a stimulus, so they can't distinguish between what's real and what's not real. So they see a face moving in a tree and they're not sure if it's real or not, or they hear a voice and they're not sure whether it's real or not. So all five senses can be affected by hallucinations. The most common are auditory hallucinations. Up to 75% of people with schizophrenia report auditory hallucinations. That sounds like a good test question, don't you think? I'm thinking 75% of people with, um, schizophrenia report, auditory hallucinations. So those are the most common. Uh, and it's usually people hearing voices that the patient mistakes as their thoughts. So they hear voices and they think that those are their thoughts. Uh, the voices are usually not nice. They're usually arguing. They're usually yelling at the person. They may be saying obscenities. They are oftentimes criticizing the person, but they basically will comment on what the person's doing and command them and they are often very punitive. Now here is a link. This is a YouTube video but it's actually only auditory and if you want to give a listen to this. I think it's really interesting. It is a staged example of what that's like for a person with schizophrenia because for you and I 
you know, you, we have thoughts all the time. You know, I'm, I'm thinking I need to get up and get a drink, or you might have a song in your head that you're repeating over and over again. But those things aren't bothersome to us because we understand that that's our own thoughts. But people with schizophrenia, they don't understand that. It actually does sound like a voice. So this clip mimics what it's like for a person to have auditory hallucinations. Um, it's, it's really interesting. So go ahead and give a quick listen to that, if you will. Any of the other symptoms or any of the senses can be affected. In this same hospital that I was working at that I just told you about, we had uh, these therapy groups, and this was in Florida, and one guy I remember had hallucinations of little alligators on the floor, and they were tactile hallucinations also. So he would be sitting there in group, and he would see all the little alligators running toward him on the floor and then he would see them crawling up his shins and he would brush and touch his shins constantly because he could feel them nipping at them. Um, olfactory or smell hallucinations can happen also so any of the five senses but the auditory are by far the most common. Okay uh, next category these are symptoms of affect or emotion and we see or mood so we see a variety of things here in this disorder some patients have what we call flat affect which is where they just they don't show any emotion I don't know if you, any of you know who this is this is John Hinckley Jr. who tried to assassinate Ronald Reagan he was the guy who had the obsession with Jodie Foster and uh, was trying to impress her by doing some big criminal act like trying to shoot Ronald Reagan and uh, he went, he was diagnosed with schizophrenia and he lived, he was kept in St. he was found not guilty by reason of insanity and was kept at St. Elizabeth's Forensic Hospital in the DC area for a long time. And he was just released, I believe. So he will be tailed by the Secret Service apparently his entire life. I read that. But uh, he has been declared in remission and um, highly unlikely to harm anybody else. But, um, this was what he looked like all the time. He absolutely had that flat affect. And then sometimes we'll see patients with what we call blunted affect, which is where they show very little emotion whatsoever. And some patients have inappropriate affect. So they'll give a response that's not suited to the situation. They may laugh when they hear about a tragic fire, or they might get angry if you ask them, hey, how are you today? Or they might get angry if you give them a present or so. Um, so we know that this emotion is also this inappropriate emotion is can be an early warning sign of schizophrenia. There have been studies, the first one was in 93 and they've done more, showing that patients with schizophrenia as adults tended to show more negative emotions and fewer positive emotions as kids. Now this doesn't mean that if you've got a kid who's, you know, is angry and tearful or sad all the time, this doesn't mean they're going to have schizophrenia. This is a retrospective study showing that people who do have schizophrenia, they have that tendency as a child. So the emotion can be an early sign. <coughs> we also know that some people with schizophrenia, not all, but some have disorders of motor behavior. And there's a wide variety that we see. Some people demonstrate hyperactivity. So they just can't sit still or they're fidgeting. Um, I'll give another example here in a moment. Some people exhibit catatonia. You've heard of the term catatonic. This is an example of catatonia over here. So catatonia refers to the somewhat rigid immobility of a person um, like this. We don't see this too often anymore because medications can really help with that, but it, it can be sometimes a sign of schizophrenia. And one of the fascinating things we very often see with catatonia is something called um, a waxy flexibility with this. Like, I don't know if y'all remember the cartoon Gumby or ever seen a Gumby doll. They're these rubbery dolls that you could just move their arms and legs in any position. So for example, if this woman has the waxy flexibility, you could walk up and switch her arms around and then she would hold it that position for long periods of time. So people really have an ability to hold positions for a long period of time that are just really hard to understand. And then another motor behavior that we sometimes see is called stereotopy. The video with Jerry, he does a lot of hair twirling and that's an example of stereotopy. So it's some kind of a repetitive motor behavior. 
that doesn't seem to really have much of a function other than it may be self-soothing for the person. That's really about all we understand about it. Okay, the last category of symptoms here, um, or uh, excuse me, two more, social behavior symptoms. We see social withdrawal very commonly, and schizophrenia often begins to show itself this way. So when people look back, that, you know, family and such looks back, that may be one of the very first signs that their loved one um, displayed was social withdrawal, not wanting to be with family. Sometimes people will hoard odd objects like wax paper, or string. Um, this man here, you know, there may be something he's hoarding. There's a lot of bags, but who knows what's in it. So they may hoard something strange like um, plastic bags. And then people will often uh, display anhedonia, which we talked about with depression. So they lose interest in activities they're normally very interested in. Okay, and then this is the last category of symptoms, sort of the wastebasket category, other symptoms. Sometimes people will display something called avolition, which is when they can't get themselves motivated or pursue certain things. And this would be things like self-care or personal safety. So sometimes people with schizophrenia will, they won't shower or they won't, you know, know to brush their hair or take medicine, take their medicine. Um... They may put themselves in dangerous situations, you know, not be able to keep the house clean, things like that. So it means a lack of motivation to pursue things. And then occasionally we will get people who will have kind of a confused sense of self. Uh, gender is a common one. And, and we're not talking about gender identity issues here or uh, the gender diversity. These are people that that's not what's going on. This is part of the schizophrenia or they won't really, they'll have a strange, unusual sense of their own identity. So those are really symptoms of, of schizophrenia. Now, of all those symptoms that I just went through, I don't have a slide showing this, and, and I'm not going to ask you this question, but you have to have at least two of the major categories for a period of six months. So you have to have delusions and hallucinations, or delusions and catatonia, or um, you know a thought symptom and hallucination so two of the major categories you have to have for a period more often than not for a period of six months and then there's some other some other criteria too but those are really the main ones okay so the last thing i want to talk about here in this lecture about symptoms is how we categorize schizophrenia Years ago, they used to have different types of schizophrenia, like paranoid schizophrenia and disorganized schizophrenia, and they don't think about schizophrenia that way anymore, but they do have two major categories that help for prognosis and also diagnosis. So let me explain these here. One category of symptoms looks at negative symptoms. So the way to think about negative symptoms is that these are things that people normally display, but they're not there in a person who has schizophrenia. We can think about them as behavioral deficits. These are things normally present in a person, but they're not with this disease. So for example, flat affect. Healthy, typical people show emotion. So if you don't show emotion, that would be considered a negative symptom of schizophrenia. Healthy people talk. I didn't talk about this symptom, but if you don't talk or say very little, which is sometimes referred to as poverty of speech, that would be considered a negative symptom. Another one would be catatonia. Healthy people move. They have body movements. So if you don't and you display catatonia, that would be considered a negative symptom. And this picture here is an example, uh, obviously many years ago, of a former patient that had catatonia. So think about negative symptoms as being a loss of normal functioning. And then we also have positive symptoms of schizophrenia. <clears throat> and these are behavioral excesses. So think about symptoms that healthy people don't have, people with schizophrenia do have, and that would be a positive symptom. So for example, hallucinations, delusions, psychomotor agitation, this is that hyperactivity that we talked about. So these are things that healthy people don't have, but when a person with schizophrenia does have this, that's considered a positive symptom. Uh, 
the difference between now there there's the reason that these it's important to know whether a person has mostly positive or mostly negative and lots of people have both but you look at the preponderance is because it makes a different with prognosis so in the next video I'll talk a little bit more about that but for now what I want you to know is we don't have specific categories of or types of schizophrenia but we look at the symptoms and how we can categorize those uh, the difficulty of diagnosis um, Schizophrenia is difficult to diagnose because the symptoms overlap with just so many others. And just to give you an idea, there is an average delay of three years to get the correct diagnosis and treatment because they tend to rule out lots of other things first, mood disorders or schizoaffective disorders, which is a kind of a, um, a whole different disorder. It really is very difficult to diagnose. And especially you know if you've got a kid or a young teenager who's having these disorders it's really rare that these symptoms manifest in younger people but when they do we kind of wait them out to see how things develop as people get older and they try not to make a diagnosis immediately okay the last thing on here is i want to tell you about this individual and then i'll have you watch this video but then we'll stop this is um uh, author named Ellen Sachs. I don't know if any of you are reading her autobiography for the project you have to do, but she wrote a book a number of years ago called The Center Cannot Hold. She is a law professor, um, mostly, and she has schizophrenia. She was diagnosed with schizophrenia in college. I am attaching, I absolutely want you to watch this. It's an interview with her. Now, the one caveat I have to make is that this was done by like a she lives in California. She teaches at Berkeley, like a local news person. And the, the news person's a little bit flaky, but what I want you to pay attention to is what Ellen Sachs has to say. I have seen her speak in person a number of times at different psychology conferences, and she is beyond impressive. You can look up her TED Talk. She's done that. But she was diagnosed with pretty severe schizophrenia, given a terrible prognosis in college, and then has recovered. She is a distinguished law professor and also psychiatry, and uh, her her story is just incredible. So I want you to watch this, and then at the beginning of the very next video, I want to mention a couple of other things about her. So please take a look at that. Okay, so this is the end of the first video for schizophrenia, and we will come back with the second one and talk about cause and treatment.